50 years ago. Man is about to launch himself on a trip to the moon. Mankind redefined what is possible. Lift off on Apollo 11. This is the story of a generation's ambition. All I can think of, this is nuts. The risks they took. If I had been older, I might have had a heart attack. And if that failed, you had two dead men on the uh, surface of the moon. The people who blazed the trail. I was the only woman in, in the field. I was a part of it, a very important part of it. It's wonderful. The generations they would inspire. Apollo 11 is a national watershed event. I get emotional when I kind of think about it. The technology that made those dreams come true. You have to be pretty precise. And if you goof, bad things happen. This is the story of American ingenuity. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. One of the greatest human achievements in engineering ever, ever done. And the greatest leap in the history of civilization. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This is the story of Apollo 11, 50 years later. It was 1961, the heart of the Cold War, and the Soviet Union had reason to celebrate. Cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin had just become the first human to reach space. The United States had been watching with a wary eye ever since the Soviet satellite Sputnik entered Earth's orbit. And with the space race now well underway, many Americans feared the U.S. was falling behind. By that May, President John F. Kennedy was determined to move ahead. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The United States had a total of 15 minutes of human spaceflight experience. So it was a really short suborbital flight uh, with Alan Shepard at the beginning of the month. And by the 25th of May, President Kennedy was proposing Project Apollo. It was a daring challenge that would ignite American momentum. With new urgency, NASA's fledgling Mercury and Gemini projects scored quick success. Zero G and I feel fine. John Glenn's solo orbit, and for the first time, spacewalks. NASA astronauts, engineers, and American industry spent the decade working round the clock. And by 1967, it was time for Apollo's first manned flight. But before it could take off, tragedy struck. Flames trapped the three-man crew inside the cabin during a launch test. There was no escape. But the heartbreaking setback proved temporary. And with a critical redesign, Apollo was back on track. Christmas Eve, 1968, the world watched as Apollo 8 astronauts ventured further than humans had ever traveled. I can see the entire Earth now out of the center window. Bringing us our first full view of home, an image that helped unite Americans at the end of a turbulent year. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good Earth. Seven months later, the moment arrived. NASA was ready. And after years of training, so was the carefully selected team of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. I felt very fortunate to, uh, first of all, to be on that crew, and second, to fly with, uh, with Neil and, and Buzz. Neil had been an X-15 pilot. Buzz, on the other hand, was the whiz-bang orbital expert from MIT. So the two of them were extraordinarily uh, well trained and competent, and I was delighted to fly with them. On the morning of July 16, 1969, the trio made their way to the launch pad. When we had been out to uh, pad 39 before, it was a hub of machine activity. Not today, nobody's around, we're the only ones. The action this day was in mission control and along the beach and highways where a million spectators had gathered. We're on time at the present time for our planned liftoff of 32 minutes past the hour. As the astronauts climbed aboard, the world held its breath. When I was standing up there, here is the most gigantic complex pile of machinery you've ever seen in your life. T minus one minute, 35 seconds on the Apollo mission, the flight to land, the first men on the moon. The eight day journey was about to begin. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. All six million pounds of the massive Saturn V rocket roared skyward. Each of its three stages firing to power into Earth's orbit in mere minutes, 
Once there, after circling the planet one and a half times, the rocket's third stage fired again, propelling the spacecraft out of orbit and toward its target. Collins, piloting the command module, took the controls. His first order of business, separating Columbia from the spent rocket, turning it around and docking it with Eagle, the lunar landing module, known as the LEM, all while moving at 17,000 miles an hour. I always think of it as a long and very fragile uh, daisy chain of events. If, uh, if you break one little link in the chain, uh, you got deep trouble. For the next three days, they hurtled toward the moon. As the mission goes on, event by event by event, you, you, you never get a chance to relax. You worry about, oh God, what next? Before long, they had entered lunar orbit. There, Collins would stay in the command module while Armstrong and Aldrin moved into the LEM. Okay, all flight controllers going around the horn, gonna go for undocking. Okay, retro, go. Fido, go, guide, go. After a series of checks, the two pulled apart. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle has wings. The Eagle was now on its own. Still looking very good. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. Suddenly, alarms sound. A warning the crew didn't recognize threatens to abort the mission. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. NASA engineers immediately identify it as an overloaded computer, and the Apollo guidance system is able to quickly resolve the problem. Okay, we're go. We're go. Same time. We're go. The landing was still on, but Armstrong realized they had overshot their target by four miles, with a boulder field now below. Taking the controls, he spotted flat terrain further away. Hey, 75 feet. That's looking good. Down a half. And with just 30 seconds of fuel left in the tank... Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. A smooth landing in the sea of tranquility. Man on the moon. Oh, boy. Thank you. Whew. Boy. <laughs> okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breaking again. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and several hours later, Armstrong was ready to make history. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Armstrong is on the moon. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Taking the most famous footsteps in history, he relayed what he saw. The surface is fine and powdery. I can pick it up loosely with my toe. There seems to be no difficulty in moving around. A colorless, rock-filled world. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of the uh, United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Soon, it was Aldrin's turn to emerge. Okay, ready for me to come out? All set. Okay, I'm on the top step. Beautiful view. Is that something? Magnificent flight out here. Magnificent desolation. Together, they set up a camera to capture the barren moonscape. Tell me if you got a picture, Houston. Well, we've got a beautiful picture, Neil. Using every moment of their two-and-a-half-hour moonwalk, they collected rock samples, conducted experiments, and dedicated a plaque. They came in peace for all mankind. And then spoke by phone to President Richard Nixon. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I just can't tell you how proud we all are. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be here. While they explored the surface, Collins was orbiting, alone, overhead, rounding the moon every two hours, and seeing the Earth rise 30 times. Columbia, this is Houston reading you loud and clear over. Uh, I believe they're setting up the flag now. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. And the question that the press directed to me, almost exclusively, weren't you terribly lonely? And. Uh, all I could think of, this is nuts. Uh, I, it never occurred to me that I was uh, lonely. Through mission control, I, I felt like I was, part of the time I was down there with him, at least I understood what was going on. And he understood that the riskiest part of the mission was just ahead. The one that I worried about the most was Neil and Buzz uh, coming up from the lunar surface and meeting me in my 60 mile orbit above them. When Eagle, the lunar module, lifted off from the moon, there was just one engine. If that failed, 
You had two dead men on the uh, surface of the moon. That whole procedure, that was the part of the mission that I sweated more than any of the other parts. But when it was time to go, the engine fired and the Eagle rose. 1,000 feet high, 80 feet uh, per second vertical rise. Before long, it had redocked with Columbia. Very smooth, very quiet ride. Reunited, they were ready to fire out of lunar orbit and begin the three-day journey home. To fulfill President Kennedy's goal, they had to return safely and to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. They had just a 20-mile wide window. Trying to hit a 20-mile target from 230,000 miles is, you have to be pretty precise. Too shallow an angle, and they'd bounce back into space in a never-ending orbit. Too steep, and they'd burn up. Plunging back to Earth at nearly 25,000 miles an hour. 36,000 feet per second. The team in mission control kept them on course. Apollo 11, Apollo 11, this is Hornet, Hornet, over. Splashing down in the Pacific where the USS Hornet was waiting. Not knowing what they might have brought back with them, they'd spend the next three weeks in quarantine. Finally, it was time to celebrate. America had won the space race, but while seen as a victory here at home, around the world, Paula was embraced as a triumph of humanity. Neil, Buzz, and I were privileged to have an around-the-world trip. I, and I was just amazed by the response that we received. Everywhere we went, people said, we did it. We, humankind, we left this planet. People around the world were naming their kids after the astronauts. They became sort of global heroes, world heroes. It was a feat few thought even possible at the dawn of the decade. And now, with just months to spare, President Kennedy's dream had been realized. A tribute to American ingenuity and lifting America's spirits amid the horrors of Vietnam as the Cold War carried on. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Up next, we look at the people and technology that were paramount for mission success when Apollo 11, 50 years later, returns in just a minute. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Man on the moon. What? <laughs> we're going to be busy for a minute. Project Apollo and Apollo 11, more specifically, it was the first live global television broadcast in history, and people from all around the world were able to watch. And we're getting a picture on the TV. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. The estimates are between 500 and 600 million people were tuning in their television sets, and then the millions more following it on the radio or newspapers, so half the world's population was following the flight. While the world watched and celebrated the three brave men of Apollo 11, there was a relatively unheralded group back on Earth who made this a success, a group that was not lost on the astronauts in their broadcast back home from space. All this is possible only through the blood, sweat, and tears of a number of people. To all those, I would like to say thank you very much. At its peak, NASA estimates more than 400,000 engineers, scientists, computer programmers, and manufacturers contributed to putting man on the moon. While the world would know the names Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins, unsung heroes who dedicated years of work would be the guiding force to make the giant leap a reality. We had a commitment that was being made at the national level that we were going to the moon with men and return them. We all thought that was a rather ambitious program, but we all had a great deal of confidence. Sonny Maria has a long career of being a problem solver behind the scenes. I said to myself, we can do this. We just got to find a way. And we found that way. Maria was critical to overcoming the engineering challenges of incorporating the engines that would be powerful enough to take man to the moon. His team helped solve the F1 engine combustion instability problem solved the J-2 engine problem and developed the lunar roving vehicle that would fly on Apollo 15, 16, and 17. I tell people I'm the project manager who developed the engines to get the astronauts to the moon. When they got there, I had a car for the last three missions that they could drive and they didn't have to go through a rental agency to get one. <laughs> people like Jim Odom. He was the second stage manager for the Saturn V. I was in charge of engineering and testing 
of the second stage. NASA relied on legacy employees like Odom, who not only managed a critical part of the Saturn V rocket, but would continue on as a project manager for the space shuttle, the Hubble telescope, and the International Space Station, twice earning presidential commendations for his work. The sheer gratification of having met the president's desire for that milestone was outstanding. If you look at the photographs, the majority of the people who worked on Project Apollo, they're white men. That being said, there were a significant number of women who are contributing and minorities who are contributing as well. Just before landing on the moon was the most exciting part, for some of us at least. Three minutes before Armstrong and Aldrin touched down on the moon, Apollo 11's lunar lander alarms triggered. Red and yellow lights across the board. Our astronauts didn't have much time, but thankfully they had Margaret Hamilton. All of a sudden, the priority alarms came on, 1201 and 1202. And I knew that those alarms came on when there was an emergency, and they had no business going on right then. A young MIT scientist and a working mother in the 60s, Hamilton led the team that created the software for the Apollo guidance computer that was able to decipher the emergency code and avoid a mission abort. Eagle looking great. Your go. I like to say not only was it the first human on the moon, but the first software to run on the moon. In 2016, Hamilton earned the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor for her work on Apollo 11. She was also a pioneer when it came to being a woman in the working place and as a software engineer. I was the only woman in the beginning, in, in the field. There was a tremendous element of just human hard work that went into the Apollo program. The ones that I remember more than any other were the people who were putting together the space suits you would see a room of these women bent over doing manual labor with great precision, slowly putting this suit together for Neil Armstrong. And you know, if one of them slipped just a little bit, he'd go out and say, there's one small, uh, wait a minute. Uh, you know, they, his life was dependent on the quality of their work. Katherine Johnson, whose tremendous work was encapsulated in the Oscar-nominated 2016 film Hidden Figures, was renowned for her work as a human computer throughout the Apollo missions, including calculations for the trajectory of Apollo 11. After Sputnik in 1950, people began to really think about that problem for the first time, in terms of uh, race, but in terms of gender as well. That created a, a paradigm shift in the way people thought. And we can no longer sit back and try to solve problems with the same group of people that have always tried to solve problems. Through the Apollo program, doors were opened and future generations were inspired. I stayed glued to the television set. I can always remember saying, you know, I really want to be a part of that. It was 11 years later, I was starting my career at NASA. So I get emotional when I kind of think about it because the likelihood of me in 1969 being a part of something like that is was about as far as way the moon itself. Only a few get a chance to be the astronauts and they are a special group, no doubt about it, but there's a special group of people too, the inside of this agency that drives it, that makes all of those things happen. The people behind Apollo were up for every challenge along the way, but two elements would constantly remain at odds, technology versus time. Could America develop the technology needed in the time allotted? Well, the Saturn program was always going to be a massive undertaking. That would not have been possible without President Kennedy's declaration. The presidential support gave the Apollo program the resources it needed to be successful. The United States spent $25 billion on it, which today would be roughly $180 billion. The national backing was crucial, but with it came pressure. Constant pressure constant. Well, at that point, I had not had a vacation with my family for over 10 years. Without that team, this mission never would have been successful. You had hundreds of thousands of people across the country committed to Kennedy's goal, and they didn't want it to be their fault that that goal wasn't met. The first technological challenge was creating a launch vehicle powerful enough to get man to the moon. The eventual solution was the Saturn V. 
Standing 363 feet tall, weighing over 6 million pounds, the Saturn V still holds the distinction as the only vehicle to carry humans beyond low Earth orbit. At the point of Kennedy's promise, the most powerful rocket engine could produce 188,000 pounds per thrust. Werner von Braun's team and NASA calculated they would need nearly 10 times that power to get man to the moon. Thus, the F-1 rocket was conceived. The F-1 was absolutely necessary to propel as large a vehicle as we needed to design to go to the moon with three men. The first stage of the Saturn V consisted of a cluster of five F-1 rockets that would produce over seven and a half million pounds of thrust needed to quickly escape the Earth's orbit. It is still today the most powerful rocket engine NASA has ever flown, but its development had many challenges. We had a great deal of trepidation about being able to do it, and especially when our major problem showed up in the, on the F-1 engine, which was a case of combustion instability. Combustion instability, or in essence, an unpredictable possibility that the rocket could explode. The lives of those astronauts depended on, on what I said, and that, that all gets to you. It took about two years of trial and error to finally get the F-1 engine stabilized. We never understood it, but we found a way to counteract it. Once the F-1 engines did their job, the first stage was dispatched, and the job of the second stage was to propel the Apollo spacecraft even further into space. As JFK's deadline loomed, NASA was forced to adopt drastic, groundbreaking measures to increase productivity. Normally, we like to fly the first stage get it working, then fly the first and second stage and get it working, and then add the third stage. But uh, we were running out of time. NASA headquarters came up with the notion of what we call an all-up. We would put the first Saturn V all live stages at one time. It was a bold move that had never been done before. In my judgment, probably one of the biggest decisions from a vehicle standpoint that were made, and having done it, it allowed us to meet the schedule. Manufacturing a capable launch vehicle was only part of the challenge. Creating a way to guide the Apollo spacecraft was the other. Much of the computer and software technology needed was being invented in real time. The Apollo guidance computer was the most intricate and complex control computer and navigation computer that existed at the time. Apollo's computer took advantage of every burgeoning breakthrough in technology. It was one of the first computers to rely on integrated circuits, or microchips, which allowed for a more compact, lighter computer. The digital computer development was brand new. We had to work within the weight limits that the Saturn boosters could put into orbit. The Apollo guidance computers were relatively small, weighing a mere 70 pounds, but by today's standards, very rudimentary. The amount of memory in a Saturn rocket and Apollo capsule is less than what I got in my cell phone. Back then, uh, computers were programmed using punch cards that they ran one program at a time. We take for granted how our computers today can easily switch from one program to another. Multitasking had to be invented for Apollo. This level of computer programming was the beginning of an industry. There was no field in what we did in software engineering, but what, that's what we were doing without realizing that it was a field. Before the Apollo program, vehicles were not regularly controlled by computers. Airplanes at the time uh, were pulleys and hydraulics. You had a pilot who actually pulled on a lever and a pulled on a lever, and those actually actuated things. And so it was the first time that you had a digital flight control system that a human life depended on and that could successfully control a platform as complex as the Apollo spacecraft were. And there was little margin for error. It had to be reliable. It had to not only work, but it had to work the first time. And in the end, through the people and the technology, it all worked. It's great to look back, perhaps what is one of the greatest human achievements in engineering ever, ever done. How they were able to do that with such little computing capability is, is amazing. Coming up next, how Apollo 11 remains a beacon of inspiration and what the next giant leap will be in space exploration.
50 years later, Apollo 11 has left an indelible mark on the generations who have followed. With Project Apollo, one of the important sort of heritages of that program is the idea that if we can do something so challenging and so bold and so grand, um, what can't we do? The Apollo and the Saturn program hired and inspired so many young people. It inspired me to uh, end up in science and mathematics and engineering. Being able to look back 50 years ago, I think will inspire our current engineers to work together to really achieve something we haven't done in 50 years, which is pretty cool. Between public and private partnerships, as well as international space programs, resources are intensifying to accomplish more than ever before. We're in a golden age of space exploration. Currently, we have more human spacecraft being developed than ever in the United States history. With each mission, momentum is building to follow in the footsteps of Apollo 11 and put man back on the moon. Human beings haven't been beyond low Earth orbit since 1972. There's a lot that we still don't know about the moon. It's going to be an exciting 10 years or so. We'll see launches multiple times a year targeting going back to the moon. It'll be a, a next generation's defining moment that they'll be able to put people on the moon and keep them there and bring them back safely. What I see next is having hundreds of people living there, um, maybe permanently, maybe for just an extended period of time doing research or building out different things. And then, hopefully, eventually, Mars will be next. While returning to the moon may be the next stop, Mars continues to loom in the distance as mankind's next extraordinary leap. NASA ought to be uh, renamed NAMA, the National Aeronautics and Mars Administration. And I think that should be our next uh, national goal. Doesn't have to be done day after tomorrow or in a huge hurry, but it should be done, I think. Wherever mankind continues to explore throughout the great unknown of outer space, it will all be made possible by the work of hundreds of thousands who collectively made one giant leap a half century ago. To see the reaction to the general public to landing on the moon made it all worthwhile. It was a profound moment for our country. Thank goodness it worked, right? <laughs> it's reflecting back on what our legacy will be to mankind, you know? I was a part of it, a very important part of it. It's wonderful. It made me feel so proud to be an American and we had carried this stuff off. I look at the flag perhaps today a little bit differently. The responsibility for this flight lies first with history, and with the giants of science who have preceded this effort. To those people, tonight we give a special thank you. And to all the other people listening and watching tonight, a good night from Apollo 11.